wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So everyone, just so you know, um, you're all on mute. And at the end of this presentation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. You can just type them in the chat. There is a link to an interpretive plan survey that's already in the chat. And if you get a chance to fill it out for us after Professor Haycox's presentation, we'd appreciate that very much. So please join us. This is our um, fifth program here at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, sponsored by the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum. Um, we've had a number of winter series events so far. We just had a fantastic uh, dance performance by a group of Mount Edgecombe Yupik dancers. And our next public presentation uh, will not take place until February 29th. We have a couple, uh, Jennifer and Carl Probert, who are Athabascan sprint mushers. And they will be presenting to us um, on their mushing lifestyle and business. Um, they are based in Anchorage. We can't wait to host them. And um, in the meantime, today we've got Professor Haycox with us. We'll begin with our land acknowledgement for the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum. We'd like to acknowledge and express our appreciation to the indigenous people of Tlingit Ani who have occupied this land for longer than any of us can imagine. And after 250 years of colonization in Alaska are graciously allowing us to share this amazing land with them. Thank you. Our speaker today has taught full-time history at the University of Alaska for 40 years. His honors include the University System's Edith Bullock Prize for Excellence, an Alaska Governor's Award in the Humanities, and designation by the Alaska Historical Society twice as Historian of the Year. His books include A History of Alaska titled Alaska and American Colony and Frigid Embrace, an investigation of the conflict between economic development and environmental protection in Alaska. He also writes for op-ed column for the Anchorage Daily News and continues to research and write. Those are just a few of his accolades. So thank you so much for being with us today, Steve. It's wonderful to have you on and speaking about this important subject and topic and our history here. And I present him now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, it's, a, it's a delight and honor to have this opportunity. I really appreciate it very much. Um, I have a nice connection with Sitka. I've been in Sitka a number of times. I've had the opportunity to talk to audiences there. Um, I want to give a shout out uh, to uh, Rebecca Paulson and, and uh, Cora Dow for their wonderful a short history of Sitka just recently published. If you haven't seen it, you want to perhaps look that up and and uh, and read it. They did a superb job of research and and putting together that story. Um, I want to thank Hal Spackman of Sitka Historical Society, whom I've known for a while. Uh, Dagmar and I have known Rich and Susie McClear for a long time. I have a long association with Nancy Yaw. Uh, Nancy Yaw Davis. She was my colleague in the university for a number of years, and uh, we've always been in touch afterward. Um, so we have a bond place in our hearts for, for Sitka. Um, before I start my talk today about the relationship between Sheldon Jackson School and uh, federal Indian policy, I want to say a few words about what historians do. Um, historians do two things. They do their best to reconstruct what happened, uh, what actually happened in the past, primarily using the documents left behind, correspondence, uh, official pronouncements and communications, especially agency records, um, but actually anything written, diaries, business records, um, anything. But second, they analyze what they've reconstructed to search for its meaning. As my graduate school mentor uh, always put it, historians look for the meaning of past human thought and action. Not always easy to find, and including a bit of a subjective element, to be sure. So historical reconstruction and historical analysis. 
I want to focus today on two issues primarily, the federal government's response to the Alaska Purchase and the policy of assimilation, uh, both of which I think have sometimes been somewhat misunderstood. Um, a perception I've encountered frequently in doing Alaska history for over a half century is that the federal government neglected Alaska after the purchase. And there's some basis for this. There was no provision for civil government immediately after the purchase. Um, not until 1884, as I'm sure most of you know. And the U.S. Army, which had responsibility for the newly purchased territory, withdrew from Alaska in 1877. But generally, I find that perception is basically wrong. From 1884 forward, the federal government provided a skeletal civil structure. In my view, one that was appropriate for a territory about which a good deal was yet unknown, where much of the indigenous population was self-sufficient. And there were few non-natives, not more than a few thousand before 1884. That skeletal civil government was, I think, um, pretty similar to that which was provided for the other Western territories when they were young. Especially pertinent for my discussion here are the provisions for education in Alaska, which were significant and consistent after 1884. The Civil Government Act of that year mandated a general agent of education whose responsibility it was to provide education for children in the territory without regard to race. More on the race uh, issue in a moment. As I'm sure most of you know, the talented and aggressive Presbyterian missionary Shelton Jackson already had established the industrial training school at Sitka by 1884, and was in the process of establishing other schools in a number of villages across the territory. And then he was appointed a federal official. Today, it would not likely be permitted for a religious leader to simultaneously head a private missionary effort and hold an official government pen, uh, position. But in fact, across Indian reservations in the American West, the government had appointed missionaries to be federal Indian agents in the 1870s and 80s. The justification for that was that they were assumed to be moral exemplars and above corruption. Um, that didn't always be the case, uh, as it turned out. Um, and the practice was terminated in the 1890s, not because a number of those missionary federal agencies turned out not to be moral examplars, but because of the separation of church and state in the US Constitution. So there was a question then in 1884, when Jackson was appointed general agent of education, where to lodge jurisdiction for Alaska education. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, established back in 1824, had responsibility for education and other matters on Indian reservations in the contiguous states and territories. But in 1871, when directly asked about it, the Bureau had refused to accept jurisdiction for Alaska's indigenous. The ostensible reason was that there were indigenous in the territory who were not India. So, right? <coughs> Excuse me, you know what? But the real reason was that the government was working to stop corruption in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and it did not want to add a new responsibility to interfere with and occlude that effort. So responsibility for Alaska Native education was placed in a fledgling agency 
that had no operating division at the time, the US Bureau of Education, which is in the Interior Department. Its work was to gather statistics on education in the states and territories, that's it. No policy, there was no and still is no federal mandated policy on education. That agency, Bureau of Education, would have responsibility for Alaska Native education and in additional services until 1931, when the Alaska Native Service, as it was then called, was transferred finally to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. At that time, the Bureau of Education provided not just schools, but medical service, a reindeer service, cooperative stores, a supply ship, the North Star, an orphanage, three industrial schools, and a marketing agency for native arts and crafts in Seattle in order to cut out the usurious traders who were buying cheap and selling deer. So with that background, it's important to put Jackson's work at the C Sitka Industrial School into the context of Indian education policy nationwide. After the Civil War, many people in leader leadership positions in the US recognized the need for a new Indian policy, something other than the consistent warfare on the Western Plains. One of the drivers of their thinking was the Sand Creek Massacre in Southeast Colorado Territory in November of 1864, where at least 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho people, at least 100 of them women and children, were mercilessly and ruthlessly killed by people of the U.S. Army. There were three investigations into that affair, all of which condemned the killing, and the troop leader, U.S. volunteer Colonel John Chivington. And in 1867, three years later, Congress created something called the Indian Peace Commission, comprised of civilian and military members. For two years, the commissioners met with and executed treaties with over a dozen major Indian tribes. The concept that they came up with and on which the treaties were based was movement of the tribes to reservations where through education they would be assimilated into the dominant American culture. That would be the foundation of US Indian policy from after the Civil War until the New Deal of the 1930s. As we know, many, if not most of those treaties were in one way or another fraudulent, but they do, they did, and they do form the legal and judicial basis of Indian policy all the way to today. The Peace Commission would be disbanded after three years and in 1869, but Congress replaced it with a board of Indian commissioners, a 10-man body, which investigated the conditions of Indian life across the and endorsed the assimilation policy. This would lead in 1887 to the passage of what's known as the Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act. By its terms, Indians who formally severed their relationship with their tribe would be given land allotments, 160 acres for heads of families, 80 acres for single adults. Allottees had to be living a, quote, civilized, unquote, life. That is an assimilated life. More on the Dawes Act in a moment. One of the members of the Board of Indian Commissioners was an artist of the American West named Vincent Collier. A noted humanitarian and philanthropist, Collier traveled the American West between 1868 
and 1871, representing, in addition to the Board of Indian Commissioners, a Quaker reform group called Friends of the Indians. In 1869, Collier traveled to Alaska to survey native conditions here. His report would influence the government's policy regarding Alaska for a generation. He recommended that the government fund schools for natives and provide medical care, but other than that, to respect the self-sufficiency of Alaska native groups. This, by the way, was the first instance, 1869, 1870, of federal programming, federal, federal assistance to Alaska natives. The government's assimilation policy is soundly condemned today as at best paternalistic, at worst racist and genocidal. To go to another page in my notes here. Recent scholarship, mostly over the last two decades, but some before, takes us into what's called a post-colonial context. One that recognizes not just the capability of native people, a capability they always had, but their resilience in the face of a culture that was insensitive to the costs, the human costs of the assimilation policy. Deeper even than that, post-colonialism in today's world something which continues to have costs um, is getting terrific attention, as I'm sure many of you know. It's something, by the way, that Martin Scorsese attempted to get at in the now Oscar-nominated film Pillars of the Flower of the Moon. Um, if you've seen the film, uh, or even if you haven't, you may want to read David Gann's book from which the film is taken, which has a great deal more in it than the film. But the film, the film is remarkable for its focus, on, for its focus on the cluelessness of the people who were implementing the reign of terror among the Osage people in the 1920s. So it's a fair question to ask: Why would people adopt a policy? of destroying a culture. It was, many have argued, a ruthless white supremacist example of arrogant decimation as destructive of Indian lives in its way as the massacre at Sand Creek. We should understand though, that the past is not the present and people in the past did not share the perceptions and assumptions of today. As the novelist L.P. Hartley wrote, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. People like Collier and the Friends of the Indian were in their day reformers. Cultural relativism as a way of understanding different cultures and respecting different cultures was a concept of the future, not yet born in the 1870s. Then there was only one way to be, one cultural notion, and particularly one cultural notion of America, which was individualist, self-providing. The Friends of the Indians and other reformers thought they were doing a good thing, saving the Indians from extinction only through assimilation into the mainstream, they believed, could native people survive. And they were convinced that they had only a little time, for it seemed clear that the military policy of clearing the plains of Indians in order to facilitate white settlement would, in a short span of time, eliminate virtually all the tribes. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the same time, what they observed in the east of those Indian groups that were left 
There's poverty, lassitude, sickness, lack of achievement. The U.S. Army General Richard Pratt was a foremost leader of the assimilationist movement. He founded the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania in 1879, based on the principle as he stated it, kill the Indian, save the man. It was in this context then that Sheldon Jackson, as general agent of education for Alaska mm -hmm. and as an agent of the Presbyterian Board of Home Missions, oversaw the establishment of government-run village schools across the territory and the industrial school at Sitka. And also his extensive fundraising in the contiguous states for the Alaska schools. Pratt kept his students on the Carlisle campus, not just during the school year, but during the summer had them wear Western clothing, speak English, attend Christian services. Imitating Pratt, early in his administration of the Sintu School, Jackson mandated that Native parents sign contracts that would keep their children in the school for five years of compulsory attendance. Some parents challenged that policy, that practice in court, and one, much to Jackson's chagrin. But Jackson kept on with the school and with his work of establishing schools in villages under the auspices of both the Board of Education and the Board of Home Missions. One of his annual fundraising meetings every year during the winter was with Friends of the Indian. He would hold his position as general agent till 1906. It was in this context, then, that some former Sitka school students started the cottages in 1888 on mission land. The group was well assimilated, including their commitment to Christianity. The model for the cottages was Metlakatla, as you know, a village of frame houses in the 1880s where the residents owned a sawmill and a cannery worshipped in a large Christian church. The village was celebrated as an assimilationist success throughout Indian circle, uh, Indian reform circles. Cottage residents, including Peter Simpson, would eventually found their own shipbuilding company. That's Sitka. By the time of the end of the century gold rushes, the operations of the Bureau of Education in Alaska were well-grounded. In addition to village schools, there was a medical division with nurses and doctors. Eventually, the sponsorship of a number of village cooperative schools. Um, in 1900, as part of a comprehensive response to the large increase in the number of native immigrants to Alaska, up from a few thousand in 1881 to over 30,000 in the 1900 census, Congress provided for the incorporation of towns of over 300 population, that included Sitka. This allowed such towns, one of which was Sitka, to create school boards and establish tax-supported town schools. As the Bureau of Education provided for Native children, the town schools were de facto for white children. Further legislation, five years later in 1905, provided funding for schools outside the incorporated towns for white children and native children leading a civilized life. Provision consistent with the fundaments of the 1887 Dawes Act. In 1906 then, Sheldon Jackson School graduate Rudolph Walton went to court to secure legal sanction for his children to attend the white Sitka Town School, the Davis case. 
Judge Royal Gunnison, in deciding that case in 1908, applied a very restrictive interpretation of the Dawes Act, assimilation principle. Natives were savage at heart, he wrote. Civilization, he said, was more than wearing Western clothes and holding a Western style job. It was an attitude and a conviction not to be native, not to be native. Because the children and their parents continued to associate with native people and to follow some native traditions and to eat some native food, they could not be called civilized, Judge Gunnison found, and he denied the petition for them to attend the Sitka Town School. By 1905, there were enough schools under its jurisdiction that the Bureau of Education divided the territory into several administrative districts. The superintendent of the Southeast District was a man called William Beatty. Much of his time had been spent mediating between William Duncan and Edward Marston over who was going to control Metla Katla. But in 1912, he held a district-wide meeting at Juneau to solicit information on the functioning of the schools in the various communities in Southeast. He was particularly interested in how natives perceived the Bureau and its policies. A number of people from Sitka traveled to Juneau to participate in that meeting. Most of them graduates of the Sheldon Jackson School and residents of the cottages. It was while in Juneau that 13 of the Sitka people decided to form their own assimilationist organization, the Alaska Native Brotherhood. The purpose of the organization was to encourage natives to prepare themselves for citizenship and a civilized life. Members would need to speak English, would need to be self-supporting, and adhere to Western standards of life, including becoming Christian. They adopted onward Christian soldiers as the ANB anthem. In later years, responding to a number of circumstances, leaders would revise the ANB constitution to eliminate the English only provision and to become far more committed to the acceptance of natives and to some degree native traditions on their own terms. The fundamental notion there was that natives should control native development. But in the beginning, in 1912, the ANB was an assimilationist organization fully consistent with the mission school and Bureau of Education policies. Many aspects of ANB history are well known today, including the work of William and Lewis Paul. When I first came to Alaska in 1970, um, I spent four or five years of intense study of Alaska Native history and the history of the ANB. Um, now, most people are familiar with William Paul's uh, becoming the first Native attorney, the first Native elected to the territorial legislature, which he was in 1924, 1926. Mm -hmm. His challenge to the exclusion of Natives from voting in 1923. He and Lewis, his brother's publication of the AMB monthly newspaper, Alaska Fisherman, and William Paul's subsequent long career, up to and including his early advising of native negotiators for the 1971 Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. What is not well known is that the foundation of the ANB in association, in association with the Bureau of Education 
not well known is that the foundation of the A and B took place in association with the Bureau of Education district meeting in Juneau in 1912. Well, I've talked for quite a bit now. I hope I've made the point that from America and Alaska's beginning, the federal government did not neglect Alaska or its native people. I hope also that I've helped reconstruct the context in which the government's education activity took place. And I hope too, that I provided some insight into assimilation and its challenges. It's hard, I think, to get our minds behind the notion that these folks who were so destructive of native culture, the longevity of which continues today, thought of themselves as doing good, as doing the best that could possibly be done for native people. It takes a little bit of uh, expanding one's mind, I think, to grasp that. It certainly did for me. It still does for me. There's more to this story. Uh, but suffice it to say now that in 1931, the Bureau of Education's Alaska Native Service was transferred, as I noted, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And subsequently, with the election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 and his selection of John Collier as Indian Commissioner in 1933, would begin the end of the assimilation policy. Though today, as I've said, we still deal with the vestige of it. Of it. That's a fascinating story, um, but I think we should probably save that for another opportunity, another time. Um, that's an awful lot of information for a short period of time. Um, I thank you for your patience and your indulgence. Uh, and I'd really be happy to, to take any questions that may be roiling around. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, if you have a question, if you could please type it into the chat and I'll read them aloud for everybody. Uh, I think I think Tia who's online has a question. Do you want me to chat it out or is it okay if I just ask? Um, if you'd like to ask, that's fine. We typically have it in the chat and then I read it aloud, but please feel free. Okay. Seems like kind of a small group here today. Um, hi, Professor Haycox. I use your book, um, The Alaska. Uh, I use this book quite often in the classes that I teach. So I appreciate the, um, the way you. it's written um, and the work that you've done. I'm wondering how the field of history, like the discipline of history, is kind of um, like you like you mentioned this concept of post-colonial context. Native people understand the relationship between ourselves and um, the federal government as inherently settler colonial, which is a an ongoing pattern. Um, and so I think that the field of history may be by using this term post-colonial, it's almost trying to assert that the colonial project is complete, whereas um, the relationship between Native people and colonization is ongoing. It's our current context. And so I'm wondering what your response is as a historian about that term and like maybe if there's any movement towards like thinking about it in a different way? Terrific question. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> and thanks for using the book. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. I hate the term post-colonial. Um, and, and, and for the very reason that you identify, that it doesn't change the overall context in which this thinking is taking place. 
I'm I am not native. I I I wish I could imagine, I suspect I cannot imagine what it is like to negotiate, to navigate these two worlds and to bring them into harmony. I know a lot of people who've done that successfully very well, and I also know people who have not. But your question is directed to historians and history and, and what should we do about that? There's a terrific column in the New York Times today, this very day. Yes. Uh, she did a fantastic job. I think she was terrific. Um, we have to recognize in ways that we, when I say we, I mean the historical community. I would, of course, expand that to the rest of the community, but particularly historical community, we have to recognize two things, it seems to me. As I suggested in the talk, the resilience and the capability of Native people. It's always been there for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean from, from, the, from 1867, Tlingit people were approaching the U.S. government and saying, hey, where do you get off with taking this land that was never formally given. So that capability has always been there and the resilience is, is, is remarkable. So we need a new term. And I think that term has to come to us from native communities. Native communities need to tell the scholars and the rest of the, of the, rest of the white establishment how to begin to rethink this. Scholars are trying. Um, uh, Julia Peguez, who's from Juno, who's now teaching at Harvard, um, has written a terrific book about it. Um, there are other scholars who, who and I can, and I can, um, I can send you the, the site for her book. Um, other scholars are joining in. Um, but you are, in my view, you are absolutely correct. The term post-colonial simply perpetuates the way we've been thinking about two different worlds and one on top of the other. And that has to stop. Quiana, for your response. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's see, here we go. Um, so Ross Cohen writes, great talk, Steve. The land claims movement, which in some respects began in 1929 at the A&B Grand Camp, marks a stand for sovereignty that runs counter to the ethos of assimilation you referred to. Can you speak to that transition and how the threads of assimilation and sovereignty ran side by side for decades? Well, and I think they still do. Um, and and uh, for those of you who don't know, Ross Cohen is uh, an, a PhD historian. Uh, um, he's written a couple of books on Alaska history. Um, and he edits the uh, Journal of the Alaska Historical Society, which is called Alaska History. Um, I, I, as I tried to suggest in my response to Tia, uh, these, these two things run together. They run hand in hand. Uh, that transition, that transition that began in 1929 was in the legal judicial context. And it continues to run today with, with two, if essentially two sides, one represented by those people who think that sovereignty greater sovereignty, legally recognized sovereignty is necessary in order to provide a foundation for native independence and for, um, for if, if you will, um, capitalizing on native resilience. There's another side that says, wait a minute, we have to follow the law and the law does not provide for an independent 
sovereign jurisdiction within state jurisdiction and within federal jurisdiction. There's no finality on that question yet at the courts. Uh, Heather Kendall Miller and other folks associated with the Native American Rights Fund have tried to force a solution to that argument, if you will, unsuccessfully. Uh, they took the Venati Village case to the Supreme Court and lost. This work is continuing now. How much sovereignty and how should we define sovereignty and what should be its relationship to state and federal governments? In a sense, it's a reflection of the question that Tia asked. Um, how can we break out of the context in which we have been operating and see Native people in a new light, in a different light? Would sovereignty do that? Um, there was a very interesting article written by an historian 35, 40 years ago, Kenneth Philp, in which he argued that pushing hard for a separate Native identity actually drove a wedge between Native and non-Native peoples. I think we've gotten beyond that, but I'm not sure. I think there are still a number of people who, who are trapped in, in that dilemma. So it's a great question, Ross, and I don't know that my answer is particularly satisfactory because I don't know where the solution is and how much sovereignty is appropriate and whether sovereignty would do what native uh, advocates of native sovereignty hope that it would do, which is to give natives more independence, greater self-control, the very thing that William Paul uh, dedicated his life to, Indian self-control. I would hope so, um, but I'm not sure. Thank you so much for taking that question. Um, and, and I've got a question. Um, this is Jackie from Sheldon Jackson Museum. I'm curious, um, Steve, I've heard some critics of Sheldon Jackson say that in their opinion, Jackson was really not that different from Richard Henry Pratt. Um, would you agree with that assessment or do you feel that there were differences? And if so, what are some examples of those differences? Thank you. Sure, that, another great question. I think that essentially Jackson was an imitation of Pratt as I suggested, but he was forced to recognize what Vincent Collier had recognized when he came up here in 1870. And that was the self-reliance, self-sufficiency of Alaska Native people. Um, they had not been cowed, if you will, in the way that the Plains Indians had been essentially defeated by the United States Army. Uh, and, and they had been living off of the land. They had been utilizing subsistence resources, traditional subsistence resources from time immemorial. Um, and Jackson was forced to recognize that. And the village teachers that he sent out had to recognize that. Uh, and, and, and some were able to work with that appropriately, perhaps, and others were not. Um, so I think, but I think that in his own mind, Jackson, first of all, Jackson was totally committed to the assimilationist policy. Uh, I don't think he ever wavered from that. Um, but I think, as I say, he was forced to recognize the self-sufficiency of Alaska Native people in a way that uh, simply did not obtain in the contiguous states. There's an important point here that didn't come up in Jackson's time, but it has come up in our time. And that is that the US Congress, as part of a peace policy, as part of this change of Indian policy after the Civil War, in 1871, ceased making treaties 
with, with native groups, with Indian groups. Uh, what was a treaty? A treaty was essentially drawing a box around some land uh, in order to extinguish native title outside the treaty box. That never happened in Alaska, no extinguishment of title. And the title question of Indian native land in Alaska was not settled until 1971. Um, that, in a sense, gave Alaska natives some independence, a great deal of independence, uh, that natives in the contiguous state did not have. Um, that's another part of the story that we probably should put off to another time. But I think that's the one difference for Sheldon Jackson was that he had to recognize the self-sufficiency, which of course ran counter to the notion that we kill the native and save, save the man, if you will. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful, thoughtful questions from a number of people. Any other comments or questions before we wrap up? Okay. Um, Addison Field asks for the title of the, the New York Times article. Um, I can probably look that up right now. It's on the opinion page uh, today of the NYT. I'll tell you who it is, if I can, who it's by. It'll take me a second to pull this up. That was a little luck. Almost there. I think. No, my phone access is not going to get the opinions. So I, oh, here we go. I got it. Maybe. I'm going to have to, um, I'll send it to Jacqueline as soon as we are, are off here because I know I can get it on my computer. Is it the um, article about the museum removing native displays amidst the new federal rules? Yes. Yeah, I copied and pasted it in the chat so people have access to it. Thank you very much, Tia. Thank you. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, I think this concludes the talk, but please check out the article that Tia kindly put in the chat. Thank you all for attending. Please do take some time to fill out the interpretive survey if you're able to, and I hope you can make it to our February 29th event with our Athabaskan Baskin Sprint Mushers giving their talk. And thank you so much, Steve, for this wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. Well, um... I overloaded folks with information, but I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope it was useful for some. We're so glad to have a speaker give this kind of a talk. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for being here.